Good morning, everyone. We're going to be continuing through the book of John. If you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 13. Last week, we were a time before we last. We were on chapter uh, verse uh, 31 through 35, and I definitely appreciate uh, Jeff preaching last week and allowing me to go to uh, officiate a friend's wedding in San Antonio. Uh, so time before last, we'll recap just a little bit as we've been going through the book of John. Uh, John 13, 31 through 35 contains the new commandment that Jesus is giving his disciples and giving to us as well. And it's an extremely important passage uh, where Jesus introduces a new commandment that sadly this passage is often overlooked. Uh, it is a new commandment. Uh, what is it is interesting. We covered that a couple of weeks ago. Like if you were asked right now, don't answer out loud, but if you were asked right now, what is the new commandment that Jesus gave for us to follow? A lot of believers would not have anything come to mind right away. But yet this is extremely important to the new covenant, to the new Testament, uh, to Jesus teaching. And as he's giving his last instructions on the night of his betrayal, that he gives this instruction, I'm giving you a new commandment. And that new commandment is to love others as they have been loved by Christ. So the new commandment to love is not new in and of itself, as we covered. Uh, but what is new about it is the example of Christ's love and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to love one another, given to all who are in the new covenant. And so much so, if you just kind of look back at verse 35 there in chapter 13, that this command... And keeping this command is so, uh, it should be so prevalent, it should be so revealing that it reveals who is truly his followers and who are not his followers. There are plenty of people today in the world that claim to be Christians, and oftentimes we, we note how their doctrine is not lining up with the Bible. They've created their own version of Christianity. You could take some uh, extreme versions like a Jehovah Witness or like a, like a Mormon, right, that often claim still to be Christians, yet they've changed the deity of Christ. They've changed the definition of Christ, and their doctrine is not Christian. Uh, so sometimes we use the doctrinal test uh, of, of their theology, of their beliefs. Is this person truly a Christian? But also... Uh, John elaborates on this command in his letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, that there is this love test. Whereas if, if you claim to be a Christian, yet you hate your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're not a Christian and you're walking in darkness. So this, this, this command is supposed to be so revealing that those who have, been, uh, have the Holy Spirit, who have been regenerated, are in the new covenant, are to be honoring this because of the heart work that's been done inside of them, that it becomes evident not only to believers, but even evident to the world that that person loves like a follower of Christ. So a very challenging, challenging scripture we looked into. Uh, what does it mean for you to us today, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, if there's no desire to love fellow Christians... This is not a good sign, all right, because this is how we are to know, how the world is to know that you're a follower of Christ. Uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John deals a lot with that, and he calls them out as living a lie. They're professing Christ with their mouth, but they have no love of brother and sister in, in Christ. Uh, this is revealing that their profession is not lining up with who they truly are. Uh, also, we, we want to analyze this and realize that none of us are loving one another perfectly as Christ loved us, and we always have room to increase. What should we do about that? You should seek and pray. God, help me to not focus on myself so much. That's who we mainly focus on naturally, but help us to be sacrificial. Help me to be sacrificial. Help me to see others' needs and meet their needs and to be more active and loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. So a challenging passage, as we looked at that a couple of weeks ago, extremely important. And if you missed that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it, go back and read this, read it and accompany it with John. It explains so much in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John about this. All right, today let's move on to uh, verse 36. We're going to go through verse 38. Just a few scriptures here. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? 
Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to gather together in this building today, Lord, from all over the place, uh, believers who have you in common and have salvation through Christ in common, who have been, been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, who we trust in your word as the ultimate authority of what we should believe and how we should live. Even as we just reflected on the new commandment, how important it is and how revealing it is to not only other believers, but to the world how we love one another should be, be, be tantamount, so important that it should reveal if we're true believers or not. God, I pray that we would increase in that. May we see the importance of that. May we love one another as you have loved us, God. And I pray as we look at your word today, may we be edified and may we be encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if we look back at verse 36 there in uh, John chapter 13, it says, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. So this question of where are you going is kind of what we're going to focus on right away. Peter seems to be uh, in some type of denial, not, not fully understanding the teaching of Christ that has been prevalent for, for a long time now that he is going to die and is about to be gone. And if you just look back basically within the same conversation, look back at John chapter 12, verse 30 through 33, just a page over, maybe even on the same page. All this is happening here at the same time. And Jesus is telling them what's going to happen ahead of time. So he's been preparing them for this, telling them these things. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So just earlier, Jesus had just told them this. Now is that time. We spent a lot of time, time looking at that a few weeks back because he, before this, he kept speaking of the hour that was to come. The hour was that climactic hour of his life, of his mission that was going to take place. Now there's a transition. Now that time has come. It is present. It is here. The hour has come. He is going to be glorified. He is going to be casting Satan out. Uh, the gospel is going to be able to go forth into all the nations then. Also, we see here that he is going to be lifted up. This is another way of speaking about death on the cross. That's why John says in verse 33 of chapter 12, he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. But now this is not the first time that Jesus had told them how he was going to die and what was going to happen. Uh, the book of Mark covers it many times. Uh, Luke 18, if you would mind look over at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, this happens right before the triumphal entry. As we're looking at the, the last week of Christ's life here, uh, before Jesus enters in on the donkey and they throw the palm branches down and yell Hosanna, this conversation happens before that. Now, today in the book of John, Jesus has already entered in and he is at taking the last uh, Passover with his disciples. But there's a lot of content. He's going to be teaching them in this last night. But here in this Luke 18 passage, before he goes into Jerusalem, he says, In taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles... He will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. So here, even though disciples were told this often, Mark lets us know he told them multiple times on the way to Jerusalem even, he goes over details about all of these things, they remain ignorant, if not even in denial, that this needs to happen. So, so when Peter's like, where are you going? Uh, it should be common knowledge. He's told them all this time, but yet it is not. Now, uh, this is not only the, what the, the disciples tended to believe, what the rest of the Jews believed. They wanted that Christ was going to come and he was going to reign eternally. And we looked at this a few weeks back. Uh, they were right and wrong by that. As far as 
when the Christ came, they thought he would stay and just remain as is, and that he would be reigning right there in Jerusalem. The Romans would be kicked out, and it would be more like the Davidic kingdom right there, and he would rule and reign. And it was a very earth-centered view of Christ. But Christ came, and his view is much higher than that. It is eternal salvation. It is worldwide salvation going far beyond just Jerusalem. And it's not just to rule and reign and kick the Romans out. It is to rule and reign and kick sin out, true salvation, to kick Satan out, to give us eternity in heaven. So it's much greater than what they have in mind. But if you look at uh, John 12, verse 34, you'll see quickly, and you might recall this a few weeks back, uh, kind of the, the thought of the Jews at that time. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? So this, this forever uh, comes from most likely like the first Samuel chapter 7, 14 through 16 there where, where that uh, prophecy of Nathan gives it to David and says, You're one of yours, right, is going to reign forever and have an eternal kingdom. And they looked at that and thought that was going to happen when the Christ came right there in Jerusalem. But as we find out, again, the picture is much greater than just reigning from there in Jerusalem. The Christ is eternal. Uh, the Christ lives right now. The Christ, Christ reigns supreme, uh, but not in the way that they were thinking. But the disciples seem to be thinking that as well. Like Christ is going to die. I'm going, I mean, he keeps telling them, I'm going to die. I'm going to Jerusalem. There I'm going to get flogged. There it tells them exactly how it's going to happen. And then now the night of his betrayal, Jesus is saying, I'm, it's about time. I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to cast Satan out. I'm going to be lifted up. Uh, and now I'm going away. And Peter's like, wait, 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 where are you going? It's like, I've been telling you this <laughs> this whole time, right? Uh, look over at Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 23. And you get a bird's eye view here, a kind of a focused view, microscopic view of one of the disciples. And that's Peter. Peter did not think it wise for Jesus to die and tries to talk Jesus out of dying. Which, when you're trying to talk God out of something, it's probably not going to work out. All right, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. This is a bit earlier, but you can get a picture of what Peter was thinking and the earth-boundness, the, the, the earth-centered. He wanted him right here to stay here. But look at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. That's not a good idea, right? To rebuke Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And it's not as if J Peter did not know who he was at this time. Because if you just go up a few, pa few verses there in your Bible, you'll see Peter's great confession where Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah the prophet, some say a great prophet. And what does Peter say? You are the Christ, the Son of God. And it's like this great, bold profession. And Jesus says, blessed are you because God the Father has revealed this to you. Peter's head gets big and then he blows it right away. He's like, he's, he's, he, yes, I've gotten it right and this is it. You are Christ, the Son of God. And then just a few moments later, he's rebuking the Son of God. Uh, so this is Peter. He's always putting a foot in his mouth, all right? So he begins to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And what's he talking about? He's talking about the death, the crucifixion. This, no, 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 no. Uh, I know you're saying this, but I've got better plans for you. And just, just stick with me, and we're going to work this out, and that's not going to happen, all right? So what does he say? Jesus say? Look at verse 23. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is, this is bold. Uh, and this is what Peter, the other disciples, the Jews at that time were wanting. They had their, their self-interest in mind. 
it was a, I don't want to say a, as far as a charismatic, name it, claim it, gab it, grab it, speak it, receive it type thing, but it was very me-centered. I want the Christ. I want him to do what I want him to do. I want him to kick the Romans out. I want him to rule and reign right here. And this time of earthly prosperity is going to be right here. And the disciples were fighting about who's going to be on either side of Jesus in that kingdom even. It's like, so Peter is saying, no, 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 no. We've given up everything. Don't go and die. Let's talk this out. I've got a better plan for your life. It's all about, uh, about peace and happiness and, and no suffering, okay? We're going to avoid that. What does Jesus say? You are lining up with Satan, and your thoughts, your words are lining up with him. So within just a short amount of time, you have Peter's great confession, and God revealing this to Peter to now he's, he's on the side of Satan. Yeah, with the confession that he is, he's just said, but now he's saying, oh, I know you're the Christ, the Son of God, but don't die. Don't go and suffer. Don't do this. We can work this out. i got a better plan for you. Stick with me, Jesus, all right? Uh, so Peter's thinking oh, far too selfish, and that's what Jesus says here. Your mind is on earthly things, things of man, not on the things of God. So long story short, not only had Peter failed to embrace that Jesus had come to die, but he also became so consumed with the future that the clear command that Jesus had given was overlooked. He had told him multiple times how these things were going to work out. Now it is the night of his betrayal, and Peter is asking, where are you going? Uh, so I don't want to pass over this, because I want to focus on what he should have been focusing on. So go back to John 13. And look at what was just mentioned by him. John chapter 13, 13, uh, uh, verse 33 through 35. So this was just said right before Peter is wanting to know where Jesus is going. So this is the passage we just reviewed at the beginning of this service. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, that's a wonderful, strong command. You have Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, giving this new commandment. And look at all the great discussion that erupts right after Jesus says, This is the new commandment. Do this. What does Peter want to conversate about? Does he talk about this at all? Does he have anything to say about the new commandment of Christ? Crickets. He skips right over it. There's nothing. He doesn't talk about that at all. He appears to ignore it and is more concerned about what is going, where Jesus is going and getting all of that worked out. And he's so interested in the future that he's neglecting to focus on the clear command of Christ right then and there, this new command and obeying that. Now, sadly, this can still be the case today. Many Christians find it easier to get wrapped up in all the details of trying to figure out not Jesus' departure like Peter was, but what? Jesus' return. And they get wrapped up so much in trying to figure out all the details of Jesus' return that they neglect the clear, crystal clear command to love one another as Christ has loved you. And that's a distraction. We see it here. Peter's trying to figure things all out and get this worked out in his head, and he's avoiding this clear command that Christ has given to love one another as Christ has loved them. So, thinking on that, Christ has not commanded you to know the hour of his return, but he has commanded you to love one another as he has loved you. Uh, we will be known by the way we love one another. And this should be, what, even if you are thinking on these things and want to look into those matters, right, it should not become a distraction where you negate this clear command to love one another as Christ has loved us. So many Christians skip over this new command, uh, just like Peter did at this time. Later he elaborates on it uh, when he writes First Peter and, 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 and uh, talks about this more. So we know it eventually... <laughs> It hits home. He does well with it. But at this time, he skips over it and goes right into, wait, wait, wait. I've got to figure all these things out. Where are you going? What's going to happen? But this is what we need to rest in. The future is perfectly known to God. 
not us. But what has been revealed to us is the command to love one another as Christ has loved us. So this should have been their focus of discussion. Uh, and we don't want to make the same, the same mistake that they were making there. But focus on that. Think on these things. New command that God has given us is extremely important. We may never know. And uh, Christ says no, no one will know the exact time of his, uh, uh, his coming back, right? But if we spend too much energy, too much effort trying to figure all of that out exactly, uh, we can become where we're so distracted we skip over the loving one another. Uh, go back to John 13 there. And uh, in, this, in the passage we just read, uh, 13 verse 36 and 37 and 38 as well but we see that Jesus is that he is the great prophet that Moses spoke of there would be a great prophet that would come that you must listen to him or you would die that is fulfilled in Christ Christ is constantly prophesying he's prophesying about the details ahead of time how he is going to die how he's going to rise from the dead here he, he prophesies even gives the details about Peter number one his time of death. Uh, it is not going to be Peter's time to die. Jesus knows this. He also knows when it is going to be Peter's time to die. Uh, he also, number two, uh, knows that Peter is going to deny him three times that night. He also, in the same, same little section of Scripture here, these three verses, uh, knows Peter's eternal destination as well. And so Jesus knows all these things ahead of time. He knows that it's not Peter's time to die tonight. He knows when it is Peter's time to die. And this is mentioned in John 21. Hold your place there in John 13. And look over at John 21, 18 through 19. Here Jesus tells him about the time that he is going to die, 30 years ahead in the future. He doesn't give him the exact time or day, but he does tell him. And which is, which is at this, all this is happening during this restoration of Peter. As we'll get to today, Peter does deny Christ three times. The details of that are not until John chapter 18. But there is a restoring of Peter. And Peter was so uh, ambivalent, so strongly committed to, I am going to die for you. But yet he denies him three times. But Jesus kind of says, get, you're going to have your chance. You're going to have your opportunity, and in fact, you will die for me. Look at John 21, 18 through 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, as he's talking to Peter, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus says this to Peter. He is going to die, and later we find out that he does die by crucifixion. Not in the Bible, but extra biblical uh, resources there. So just, just kind of looking at this, does Jesus know that Peter's not going to die that night? Absolutely. He knows it's his betrayal time. He knows the soldiers are coming, but he knows Peter's not going to die. He knows that's going to be in the future later on, uh, which is, is fascinating as you think on these things, because you have... You have Jesus, or even David says, but you knew everything about me before I was even born. Everything has been written about me before it has even come to pass. And so Jesus knows all these things, announces all these things, right? And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but prophecy, fulfillment of prophecy is in the realm of God. That's why the Bible is so amazing. There's no other book like this on earth. We rest in the Bible because not only is it God's word, or we say it's God's word, but it proves that it is God's word. One of the ways is there is fulfilled prophecy throughout its pages. And when Jesus says this is going to happen, it happens. When Moses says this is going to happen, it happens, right? And, and you go through the prophets, how can such a thing be? We in our human minds, we don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow, next month, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now. But God does. He sees it all, announces it through this prophet, writes it down, and it comes true. And so all this, uh, Jesus is, is building this. He is God. He does know what's going to happen in the future, and they can rest in that. They're not resting so much quite yet, though. All right, but that does come. Uh, let's go on down and look at a, look at a, uh, well, well, just uh, as we think on this, I want to focus on this too. Uh, Jesus knows Peter's time of death. 
He knows he is going to deny him three times and exactly when that is going to be. He also knows Peter's eternal destination, which is important. He says, you can't follow me now, but you are going to follow me, which is a, there's, there's definitely something Peter would be resting in because he is going to deny Christ. He's going to deny that he even knows Jesus in, in, a, in a tremendous way. He's going to deny Jesus. And they could easily be doubting his salvation and doubting whether or not he would even follow Jesus, where Jesus is going. But Jesus affirms him. You will follow me afterward. As we get into John 14, we'll see more of those details. But this reminds me of like a John 6, 37 through 40. Look over there with me. John 6, 37 through 40. John 6, 37 through 40, we've looked at it several times as we've gone through the book of John, but it is a, just a beautiful passage here. It uh, speaks of a lot of issues, but look at this. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from the Father not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. So this passage should not only bring comfort to us, but it's also comforting here as we look, as Peter would reflect on these things. Peter denied Christ three times. Is this the, the absolute unpardonable sin where he now has lost his salvation, will not be saved, will not get to follow Christ? And it's not the case. He is a believer. He has sinned. He has messed up. But we also are going to find out that he will repent. But this passage, John 6, 37 through 40, is wonderful because it's all that the Father has given the Son will come to him for salvation. All those that the Father has given to the Son who come to him for salvation will be raised up. And as we've mentioned many times, how many of those are lost? There's not one. There's not one single person that the Father has given to the Son who comes to the Son who will lose their salvation. Every one of them will be raised up. And to think that you can lose that salvation is definitely anti these passages. There are those who claim to be Christians who are not Christians. We know that to be the case. Uh, but as far as those who truly believe in Christ, they have been, that, is, that is something supernatural that have been reborn, regenerated by God the Holy Spirit it is a work of the Trinity and it cannot be undone. So Peter falls into that category is my point. Does Peter sin? Does he mess up? Does he make a serious mistake? Yes, he makes three of them in a row. Is he still saved? Yes. Are you still saved even if you sin? Uh, yes, you know that that is the case. We we find in like uh, we if person remains in that sin and believers call them to repent and they will not repent and they go further into that sin. As far as we can tell, that person is acting and living like a non-believer, and that's where Paul encourages them to be excommunicated from the church, right? Uh, to remove them because they're living in non-repentance. A true believer believes. And repents. And we're going to find out today that Peter does turn. He does repent. Look at verse 37 of John 13. John 13, verse 37. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And this is an overestimation of Peter's personal spiritual strength. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big overestimation. He is saying he will die for Christ that night. He says this multiple times in multiple ways. And John records it here, but I want you to look at a couple of other places. This is recorded in all of the Gospels, but I want you to look at a couple of other places where they give a little, Mark and Luke give a little bit more detail on this. Look over at Mark 14, 26 through 31. In Mark 14, verse 26 through 31, still, still happening, the, the night of Jesus' betrayal. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. 
Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he, Peter, said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. So again, here you see it even more emphasized, right? And and what's interesting is Jesus is quoting from Scripture. You will all fall away, for it is written. So when Jesus says, for it is written, he's pulling from Old Testament prophecy. And saying, this has to come true because God has written it through the prophets here. This is going to happen tonight. And even though you have Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, saying you all are going to fall away, even though you have the word, the prophetic word of God that has to come true, what do they all say? No, not going to happen because you don't know who we are. And we are very strong spiritually. And Peter even raises it a notch higher and says, no, no, you've got it all wrong. They may all fall away, but you don't know what's in here. Like, I am not going to fall away. And Peter even says it twice. Even after the scriptures must be fulfilled, you are going to fall away. He says in 29, even though they will all fall away, I will not. And then look at verse 31. Uh... If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. So here's where they're overestimating their own spiritual strength. Not me, not me. Even though Jesus is saying, look, you're going to. It's even written ahead of time that this is going to happen. You are going to fall away. Um, Matthew's version of the account does not, does not add too much detail. So we're going to skip that. But I want you to look over at Luke 22. Luke 22, 24 through 34, it kind of compresses some of the conversation they're having uh, that evening. As you guys know, this is also when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Uh, Just Jesus, all the disciples are there to have the dinner, to have the feast. The lowest person in the home would wash the guest's feet. There's no one there, apparently. And instead of one of the disciples saying, hey, I got this, I'll wash your feet because they're filthy, they're dirty, they're walking in sandals in an arid environment, they're coming in to eat, Uh, no one did it. So as the meal goes on, Jesus washes their feet. And we we see some of this, their conversation here that's happening uh, in regards to that because they did not want to serve one another. They wanted to be served by others. And Jesus is always trying to counter that. There's much pride in them. So look at verse, uh, there's a little bit long section here, but look at 24 through 34 in Luke 22. Uh, All this again is happening during that feast. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you, rather the greatest among you become as the youngest. And the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, who, uh, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So you have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, at the table. He is the greatest, but he's also the greatest servant, right? He is the one going to wash their feet all between their toes, get the filth out. God in the flesh is going to do this. And later, he is going to, the very same night, he's going to give himself up to die for them. He's the great servant. Move on, look at verse 28. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now focus on this. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. This is Peter. To have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. So here you have this conversation of them fighting about who is the greatest among the disciples? And they're arguing about this, right? And then you, then you have, have Peter rise up above all of that during this and saying, I will not deny you. I will go to prison. I will go to death. 
uh, with you. And, and Jesus stops him and says, Satan has, has asked to sift you like wheat. And what is the counter to that? Satan wants Peter, but what does Jesus say? I have prayed for you, and your faith may not fail. Does, G does Peter fail that night? He does fail three times, but there is still faith. He has not lost his faith. He has not lost his salvation. He does, he still maintains that, even though he fails. I don't know if there's anyone here who's ever failed, but you maintained your faith, right? Uh, and this is where Peter's at. And so look at the comforting words here, though. Uh, so Satan has demanded, I mean, uh, I mean, that's a lot of, uh, right there. Just imagine Satan literally asking for you, but then he's comforted. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. But when you have turned again, verse 32, strengthen your brothers. So here Jesus not, Jesus not only knows that Peter is going to deny him three times, but he knows that his faith is not going to fail. He assures him where he's going to be one day with him, but also he is going to repent. And this is a mark of a true believer. He is going to sin. He is going to fall. His faith, the, the core of his faith is not going to fail. And that faith is going to do what faith does. Bring him to repentance. So when Jesus says, you are going to fall, you are going to deny me, but you are going to turn. And when you do return, strengthen your brothers. There's, there's a, a lot there. So many times when we mess up, when we sin, we stay in it too long without confessing, without repenting. Confess, repent. Why? Because if you don't, you're not going to be strengthening your brothers. You're not going to be loving others as Christ loved you. You're going to be focused on that, and it's going to rot your bones out like it did to David when he would not confess, when he would not repent of his adultery and murder, right? But he confessed. He was restored. He was strengthened. Then he wanted, went on to be able to strengthen others. So it is here. And Jesus is laying all this out ahead of time. You are going to deny me. You're not going to lose your faith. And you're going to return. And you're going to strengthen your brothers. Um, look, at, uh, look at verse 38 there in John 13. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Now, we know this to be the case. We know exactly how this happens. All the other Gospels have mentioned it as well. But just fast forward, since, since there, we, Jesus introduces this, you're going to deny me three times. It's all happening in the same night, but there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of conversation that John records that night. So we have to get to John 18 to see where he finally denies him three times. And we're just going to compress it, use a couple of verses there. But look at John 18, verse 25 to 27. We'll uh, fast forward to the rooster crowing on Peter's third denial. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and a rooster crowed. And here we have the third time that Jesus denies, uh, uh, Peter denies Jesus in one night. The rooster crows, and all this has to sink deep into Peter's soul. That he was going to die for Jesus, yet he's denied Jesus three times, and now the rooster has crowed. Now, what do we learn from this? Uh, the disciples were not perfect. It is clear that the Bible presents them. There's a, there's a saying, with warts and all. In other words, it does not, the Bible does not clean the main characters up and whitewash them like lots of writings do. And uh, history, they'll remove all the warts, remove all the errors, and try to whitewash it and make them all look perfect in history. The Bible's not like that. It presents David as in, in his sin, as a sinner, right? It doesn't remove that. Uh, the Bible presents Peter as who he is, a man who often puts his foot in his mouth, a uh, man who has, has issues that he, is, he deals with. And all these people are like us in a major way. They are sinners who are saved by grace. Oftentimes we think the prophets or the apostles are in a different category 
And, and to a degree they are as far as, the, far as God revealing uh, to them, prophets and apostles. But yet, in the end, they're sinners who are saved by grace. Do they still struggle with sin? Yes. Were they glorified before glorification? No. So they still struggle. And here we see some of that. The disciples were slow to believe all that Jesus said. We find that over and over throughout the Gospels. Uh, well, even with Peter trying to rebuke Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, the disciples struggled with pride. Again, this is repeated oftentimes. Even after three years of teaching on the night of Jesus' betrayal, as he is there with them, they're still fighting about who is the greatest among them. This is pride they're still wrestling with. Uh, the disciples overinflated their spiritual strength. They thought none of them would deny Jesus. And yet Jesus says, you all will deny me. And that's exactly what they did. All of this is seen most clearly with the uh, microscopic focus on Peter here today. He was slow to believe. He struggled with pride and overinflated his spiritual strength. And we can also see with Peter that there is a, an unhealthy desire to blend in with the world. This happens three times that night. When they say, oh, are you, a, are you a follower of Christ? No, 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 I'm just, I'm just over here. I'm just warming by the fire. I'm just doing this. I'm not, not with Christ. Uh, but we also see this it raises its ugly head years later uh, where Paul, the apostle Paul, has to call out Peter publicly for he's done something egregious. He's done something really bad. Uh, look over at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Uh, what does Peter do that is so bad? And if we recall, Peter was, uh, I believe Acts chapter 10, Peter, uh, Peter receives the vision from God of the tablecloth coming down, the animals clean and unclean, and uh, does this multiple times, right? And, and God says, eat, and, Jesus, and Peter says, no. And, and then finally, he, the, he gets the point. Because a Gentile comes to the door and invites him to go eat at the home of Cornelius, another a Gentile. And Jews would have nothing to do with Gentiles. They were not allowed to go eat with Gentiles. But Peter sees that God has given him this, this vision and says, What I have called clean, do not call unclean. And so Peter goes into the home of Cornelius. What does he do there? He presents the gospel. And those Gentiles believe in the gospel they're saved by that gospel. They receive the Holy Spirit. They're regenerated and given evidence of it just like it had happened to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. So uh, what happens? What transpires? Well, Peter is called to give an account of this. And he's called there in chapter 11 to go before the Jewish council, right, and talk about these things. And, uh, what, and they can't believe that he went into the Gentiles' house, dirty, rotten, sinful Gentiles. And Peter said, gives them the story. Look, I presented the gospel. The Holy Spirit fell on them, just like happened to us on the day of Pentecost. And the room grows silent. And then they say, well, to the Gentiles, God has even granted repentance of sin. Wow. This is amazing. So all that had happened with Peter. So Peter, in other words, was present. He was present for the, for the Jews, uh, their, their great Pentecost day. He was there for the Samaritans, the half-Jews, half-Gentiles, uh, receiving the Holy Spirit, their salvation as well, the, the Gentiles as well. But now you get over to Galatians, and Paul has to call Peter out because Peter is being too... Uh, He's, he's being drawn back into blending in instead of standing out for Christ. And we find that there is this, this group, this circumcision party, those who are trying to combine the old covenant and the new covenant in a way that doesn't work. Uh, they're not seeing this old covenant as obsolete, and they're trying to press it into the new covenant, adding it to the new covenant over here. And so it's against the gospel and it's against Jesus what's happening. So look at, look at Galatians 2, 11 through 12. Uh, but when Cephas, another name for Peter, came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came... He drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. 
And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So what's going on here? Uh, well, turn, turn over to Acts 15.1 again, just to get a, a little cross-reference here. Uh, Acts 15.1. And here you see... Uh, this 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 group of people, the circumcision party is kind of like the you know Democrat Party, Republican Party, the circumcision party. All right, it's a body of people, a body, a group, a political group, a religious group that has developed now. That is again, it's it's they're, they're trying to bring the old covenant over and force it into the new covenant, and even force this old covenant sign into the new covenant and make it a requirement to where you cannot be saved unless. You abide by the old covenant and get the old covenant signed. So look at Acts 15, verse 1, summarizes it quite well. Uh, Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So this is what's going on. And all this is happening about the same time as in what Paul is referring to here. This circumcision group says you must be circumcised or you cannot be saved. So this was a powerful group. It's kind of the, the old blood, the old guard of, of Jews who had accepted Christ to some degree, but yet they were very proud of their Jewish heritage. They were very proud that they had the sign of the covenant, and they lifted it so highly that it didn't allow Gentiles to be saved unless they went back to this old covenant. So Jesus says, no, I'm making a new covenant. The new covenant is in my blood. So you see that this, this, this is counter. But Peter gets sucked back into this. He is with that circumcision party, even though he had been eating with Gentiles and joined the company of Gentiles, when the group, this powerful group, powerful leaders, the circumcision party, this old guard comes down and Peter is with them, he will not eat with the Gentiles any longer and pulls away. And Peter is the leader. So what do the other Jewish people do who had been eating with the Gentiles? They do the same thing. They don't eat with them. And then Paul says, even my best friend Barnabas got sucked into this as well and would no longer eat with the Gentiles. So what does Paul do? Since Peter has done this publicly in front of others and led others astray, he rebukes him to his face. So the point of this is, uh, what is the takeaway of, of Peter's failures? Uh, Peter was a sinner saved by grace just like us. And it's not like he dealt with this issue one time. He denied Christ these three times in a row. Uh, but then later in life, we see the same thing, that, that there is somewhat of a struggle here. Like he, he, he knows the truth and, and he gets, he gets uh, called out by Paul, but yet there's this tendency to sometimes blend in when you don't, shouldn't be blending in. Uh, we can feel that, right? Even in the world that we live in, we can feel that as well. There is a desire to fit. There is a desire to blend in. But we can't forget that this world is perishing. This world is in darkness. You are not going to blend in. You are supposed to be... Uh, uh, light on a dark hill. And it's, it's your doctrine, it's your life, it's your love of others shining brightly. All right? Uh, let's see. Uh, we can take comfort in knowing that even though Peter failed miserably, Christ assured Peter that he would repent, strengthen brothers, and be with Christ in glory. Peter still had faith through his failures. Often failures rob Christians of spiritual growth and of their love of others. Jesus told Peter that he would return and was a strength in brothers, and that's what he did. Uh, will you fail sometimes? And everybody's nodding as fast as they can, all right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, does that mean that you are no longer saved? No. Nothing can, and no one can separate you from the love of Christ. All those a father has given the son come to the son, and all of them will be raised up. Uh, you will repent. You will turn. Was uh, What is the right response to failing Christ? 
confess, repent, return, rest in your salvation. Christ has accomplished that for you. And get back to strengthening and loving others as Christ has loved you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you've given us and shown us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for letting us see the great servitude that he had. Uh, God in the flesh willing to wash feet. God in the flesh willing to be flogged, betrayed, spit upon, beaten, punched, beard plucked out, spikes in his hand, crown of thorns on his head, his back whipped, and taking on our sin that we actively commit. We thank you for that great salvation that Jesus has accomplished for us. We thank you that we're not saved by works, but we're saved by grace. We thank you for the great salvation that has been accomplished and how we can see it now. As we read the gospel, it's so beautiful. And the story that we get to see where the disciples didn't get to see the end. We can now look back and see how all of it comes together. We see the prophecy fulfilled. We see that you know, we can rest in your plan of salvation and that everything has come to pass exactly as you said that it would. God, help us to, to apply these passages to our lives today. We see that, yes, Peter failed, but also we see that he turns and that he goes about strengthening others. Uh, will we fail? Yes, but our faith will not fail. We trust that what you have begun in us, you will see through to the very end. We thank you that we have been born again. And God, when we mess up, when we sin, may we turn quickly. May we repent of that sin. And may we uh, regain our strength so that we can strengthen others as well. And God, help us to abide by this great new command that you gave the disciples here in John 13 to love one another as you have loved us. In Jesus' name.